I think everyone is here, so we can start. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Alessandra Podesta and I'm Innovation Learning Manager at the Star Network. And it's my pleasure to have all of you today for this Explore session um, with the title of Decolonizing Evidence and Locally Led Defined Approaches of Measuring Program Success. So the aim of today is really to have um, a discussion and to reflect together on what alternative approaches to evidence and measuring success can look like, specifically from the perspective of local communities and non-Western lenses. We're gonna have a panel discussion with three speakers. We're gonna be introduced briefly. And the discussion is going to be facilitated by Sanyukta Murthy. Sanyukta is here with us today and she's um, planning, monitoring, valuation, learning consultant. She is originally from South India, but now based in Barcelona. And she's running her independent consultancy practice. So her work really focuses on championing diverse perspectives, the colonized frameworks and mixed methods and participatory research. And also in bridging, in bringing human voices and the passion for social change back into our work. Um, and before that, Sanyukta worked at Open Society Foundation, and she also has a background in journalism. So welcome, Sanyukta, and yeah, very nice to have you today with us. Um, before I just pass it over to you, just a couple of housekeeping rules. We have interpretation in both French and Spanish, so if you can select the language you prefer at the bottom, just close to the chat function, and yeah, you can just select the language you prefer. If you have any questions during the session, you can just post it in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them later. Thank you and over to you, Sanyukta. Thanks, Alessandra. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to some, good, mo good evening and afternoon to others. Um, so as Alessandra mentioned, my name is Sanyukta and welcome to today's session on decolonizing evidence. Um, I'm joined by an incredible panel today and together for the next hour and a half or so, we're going to discuss some shared questions and then we'll break into a Q&A session to really explore what alternative approaches to evidence and success measurement really can look like and what is wrong with the ways in which we've been doing traditional evaluation measurement all this time. Uh, so we'll start first with an overview of what it actually means to decolonize evidence specifically. Um, and then we'll have a roughly 45 minute panel discussion, roughly five minutes per question. And then we're gonna discuss uh, principles and approaches to assess programs. I'm going to ask each of our panelists specific questions, but if anyone else on the panel would like to contribute to something, please feel free to jump in. Um, and then we're going to go to around 20 minutes of Q and A's, either in breakout rooms or together as a plenary group. Uh, and if any questions come to you in the meantime, please add them in the chat box below, or you can save them for after the panel discussion. So before we get started, allow me to quickly introduce our panelists and then they'll uh, discuss more about their work. So we're joined first by Saeed Ullah Khan from Glow Consultants in Pakistan. Saeed has over 15 years of experience in the design, management, implementation, and evaluation of development and humanitarian programs. Uh, then we have Anwarite Kabuo, who works for Midefeops in Goma, Eastern DRC. And Anwarite is passionate about working in the humanitarian world and contributing effectively to the development of vulnerable communities who've been exploited in DRC over the past 20 years. Uh, finally, we have Praditya Pertiwi from Rooted Impact in Indonesia, which is an international women's collective partnership to co-create and elevate more inclusive and resilient change. Uh, Praditya is passionate about human development and how social norms and values help to shape the perception and behavior of both individuals and groups. Uh, so please take two minutes each roughly to tell us a little bit more about yourselves and specifically what brought you to this session. Perhaps starting with Said. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm uh, part of this sector from last uh, more than 15 years, uh, mainly working in uh, humanitarian context, but also equally in the development context as well. So I have been working on uh, different sides, both on the NGOs, with the uh, UN, as well as from the donor side. And lastly, from last uh, six, seven years uh, as a private sector on the evidence side, learning perspective. Uh, one of the key aspects which I think bring, uh, 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 which make us quite strong 
from an evidence perspective is that we work with the grassroots. We work closely with the communities uh, and, uh, and we engage with them and we learn from them and we consolidate and report it back. So I, I'll stop here. Thanks, Saeed. Anwarite? Oui, euh, bonjour à tous. Moi, c'est Anwarite Kabour. Euh, je travaille pour Midefort Zazbel, qui est une ONG nationale de la RDC, et membre du réseau Stat Network euh, maintenant, c'est presque deux ans. Euh, notre organisation travaille dans le domaine de protection de l'enfant et de la femme. On travaille aussi dans le domaine de l'accès aux moyens de subsistance, mais aussi le renforcement des capacités communautaires pour, pour arriver à une résilience communautaire. Mais aussi, euh, nous sommes membres du HBRDC. Nous faisons partie du leadership qui développe le HAB au niveau de la RDC. Merci. Merci, Anurite. Uh, Praditya? Thank you very much, Anjukta. Hello, everyone. My name is Titya. Um, I'm from Rooted Impact, and we're uh, a partner of Start Network um, in implementing the uh, click, sorry, uh, like capturing learning from the community led innovation program uh, from Start Network and ELRA. So I've worked in the humanitarian sectors for more than uh, 15 years, started as practitioner, but now I'm teaching and researching about uh, the intersection between uh, disability and social inclusion in this topic area. So with regards to this topic, um, actually we, we had experience, like a unique experience thinking about how we could use alternative methods, especially if we are interacting with people with disabilities, with diverse um, abilities, for example. So perhaps like uh, traditional evaluation might need to be adapted. So I'd like to uh, discuss that with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so my first question is for Anyarite. Uh, so what does it mean to you to decolonize evidence? And how does that differ to decolonizing other aspects of the m and &E process? Uh, so what specifically do you think should be decolonized and what does the main problem look like for you? Oui, euh, merci de nous avoir accordé la parole. Euh, pour ce qui est de la décolonisation d'abord, nous devons comprendre que c'est une transformation, c'est un changement. Et là, euh, au niveau communautaire, nous sommes censés travailler et développer le programme qui, qui suscite une transformation, un changement de comportement au niveau communautaire. Et s'il faut parler aussi de, de décolonisation au niveau du système humanitaire, de l'aide humanitaire, là nous pouvons dire qu'il doit y avoir changement du système humanitaire, c'est-à-dire que le travail doit être dirigé au niveau horizontal, pas au niveau vertical. Aussi longtemps que tout doit être égal, tout doit être géré avec équité, avec considération, mais aussi avec décentralisation. Donc, que la coordination soit horizontale, pas verticale, du haut vers le bas, mais que ça soit quelque chose de face à face où tout le monde parle, tout le monde discute la même chose et la décision est prise par tout le monde. C'est ce que moi j'ai compris par rapport à, ce, à cette décolonisation de, de au niveau de, de, de notre organisation. Mais aussi, euh, par là, on a compris que pour y arriver, il y a le document qui était signé en faisant référence à l'accord des grands Bergan, auquel les, do les donateurs ont pris la décision de reverser 25% du financement aux organismes locaux d'ici 2020. À part ça, il y a aussi la charte pour le changement, dans laquelle les, les ONG internationales signataires ont décidé de, de respecter les huit engagements 
qui sont repris dans la charte pour le changement, euh, sur lequel les ONG nationales et locales sont entrées dans le dossier au niveau de la RDC. Mais jusque-là, on ne sent pas vraiment un changement considérable, aussi longtemps que la localisation n'est pas encore vraiment effective. Nous sommes en train d'y travailler, mais on ne sent pas cette décolonisation de l'aide humanitaire aussi longtemps que la localisation reste un blocage pour certains. Et là, je voulais dire à titre de preuve, il y a les stats notoc avec qui nous sommes membres bientôt deux ans, qui est en train de pousser sur la localisation. Nous, nous sommes une ONG nationale de la RDC qui est aujourd'hui comme ONG responsable, qui joue le rôle du host pour les RBRDC. C'est toujours dans le but de renforcer cette localisation au niveau communautaire. Et ça, c'est une bonne expérience et que nous, nous sommes de témoins à les partager avec les autres donateurs, les autres réseaux, d'emboîter les pas selon la la logique de travail du Stat Network. Merci. Thank you so much, Anwarite. I think that's absolutely true. The, you know, changing, shifting the way in which humanitarian aid as a system or the way it's even perceived of, the way that we discuss the, the role of evaluation and development and how the power dynamics that are at play between donors and Western organizations and the recipients of aid or humanitarian assistance. That's a very important shift. Um, I'm interested to hear perhaps from the other panelists about what decolonization and evidence specifically would look like and how uh, you know, our differing perceptions of what success is actually in a project can manifest in the way that we decolonize the E of m &E. Um, May I? Absolutely, please. Sure. Uh, I think it's a good question. So first of all, I think we, we do need to understand that uh, uh, it's not necessarily that when we talk about evidence or when we talk about the communities, how they see success or when, how they, uh, uh, if there is a difference between them, uh, between the donors. But there are different uh, perspectives, especially about how the communities feel and how the, uh, the donors feel, uh, the implementers feel. Uh, and one of the major uh, uh, aspect is the level we look into. So when we talk about the donor's perspective, especially from a perspective, we look at the much uh, a higher level, at a macro level, at the outcome level. Whereas when you talk about the communities, the community look into the more output activities level. So that at the, at the time frame, uh, the donors want to see more long-term impact, whereas the communities want to see more immediate impact. So uh, an example can be uh, given a choice if a community is to choose between, let's say, um, a hand pump, get access to water, uh, they might prefer it more than to uh, a, a hygiene campaign, which might lead to a reduction in diarrhea uh, in a course of time. Or if you are talking about education activities, girls' education, let's say, is a sensitive topic. But if you tell them that whether sending a girl is more uh, important, uh, which will bring a, a whole family, uh, bring education to a whole family and have generation, future generation, they might value it less. It's not necessarily a blanket standard, but uh, at least for some, whereas the same girls, if she's provided, let's say, uh, a, a food ration as an incentive for her to achieve, to go to school. Uh, similarly, if we talk about uh, uh, from our donor perspective, moving, we do focus a lot on the uh, bureaucratic aspects, like whether the budget is spent, whether the activity is completed in time, whereas from communities, these are non-issues, whether the activities are spent, or uh, even the choices. Uh, again, I, I'll give, I'm coming from a humanitarian background, so I'll give the example from humanitarian. Uh, whether the activities are culturally sensitive. So like in a hygiene kit, maybe we are giving a toothbrush or a toothpaste. 
for uh, it's, it, it might be a success from a donor and implementer perspective, but from communities, they might not value it as much because they say, who will buy them a new toothpaste once the current uh, toothpaste runs out? Uh, how to bridge this gap? I think that's a, that's a difficult question, but one of the key important aspects is communication. We need to be more forthcoming in terms of communication, not only at the start of the program, that what we want to expect, what why we are doing a particular activities, but also moving beyond during the implementation phase as well as at the end of the program. So the feedback loop, I think this is something which is missing, uh, and this is something which need to be done uh, more proactively and more uh, consecutively. Uh, I, I'll stop here. Actually, no, Saeed, that's perfect because that was actually going to be my question to you, the second one. So how do we exactly look at those different perspectives of the longer term versus shorter term? What does the community actually need and how can we perhaps, uh, you know, as consultants, as, as we were sort of uh, separate from the whole process, is there a role for consultants or intermediaries to be that bridge between the communities and the ones sort of receiving the support or um, versus the ones who are in the donor position or the funders position and how can we balance that power a little bit more effectively is it that you need a third party to step in and and bridge that gap or is there someone else perhaps um, the local organization that is implementing the work or a, maybe a regional level partner that can be that bridge um, and what you mentioned about the different ways of looking at the longer term versus shorter term you know donors tend to look at outcomes and higher level impact Whereas what is, of course, more important to the community is the outputs and the activities itself and what they're able to see as a tangible change in their sort of short term horizon. So no, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what has been your experience of bridging that and sort of reconciling both sides needs. Um, give us more examples because this is very interesting. Yeah. So, so I think one of the definitely as a consultant, as a researcher uh, uh, coming with a background to uh, not only from implementation, but also from a learning perspective, we do have a role, a critical role. And one of this role is as a critical friend. Because once you are inside a situation, it's just like example, if your uh, hand is in a warm water, after a while, you don't feel the warm water. So we do, we do come up with a fresh perspective. Uh, and this is the role which we, are, we have provided our feedback to the uh, local partners, implementers, uh, as well as to the um, as well as to a donor. Plus another important aspect which we do bring to the table is the cross agency experience. So as a, one of the luxury of being uh, is a researcher, you, you get used to uh, experiment multiple scenarios, multiple scenario situation, multiple activities. And then you, uh, you, can this, uh, you can contribute to this cross learning between a different organization, different contacts, as well as different interventions. So something completely unrelated aspects might be very much related. Again, I'll give you an example. Uh, we were doing a wash activities uh, where the, there was a, a, a fancy uh, toilets were built uh, in one of the scenario. I mean, I'll give you the country example, Busaso, but there was no water available there. So in fact, we were doubling the work for a woman there. On one hand, they were uh, on one hand they were bringing uh, water, fetching water for drinking purpose. At the same time, then they were fetching water to clean the washrooms and to uh, fill the uh, water tanks. So again, this is something which was uh, as a as a learner when we went there and we contributed. So it was uh, the do no harm principle and everything they come into play. So uh, over to you. Thank you, Saeed. No, that was super useful and very interesting. Thank you. I think bringing that cross-agency perspective and sharing knowledge across different countries and contexts can also do a lot. So perhaps there is a scope for our role to gather evidence and gather experiences and to share case studies of uh, you know, best practices, if you will, or just something that worked or, or, or an approach that could be interesting for someone else to try. No, thank you. Um, all right. So my next question is for Anwarite. Uh, do you have any examples of where you've tried to shift the focus towards community perceptions of success? Uh, and what did that look like? Or on the opposite side, do you have experiences of where you've tried to shift it and it didn't work? And what lessons can you share with us about that process? Oh, oui, merci encore une fois. Donc, pour arriver 
à mesurer la perception d'une communauté, d'abord, il faut faire la responsabilisation communautaire. Ne pas faire le travail à la place de la communauté. Vous le laissez faire. Et puis, vous, vous êtes là comme guide. Mais aussi, euh, nous, les humanitaires, nous ne devons pas influencer les décisions communautaires. C'est-à-dire, nous ne devons pas décider à la place de la communauté. Ce qui me pousse à vous dire que, pour nous, Mide Forbes, c'est qu'on a beaucoup développé dans nos approches. Avant de faire la réalisation des activités, euh, nous faisons d'abord ce qu'on appelle l'étude du marché. L'étude du marché, c'est une évaluation qui nous permet d'identifier les potentialités nécessaires communautaires qui peuvent nous guider dans l'avenir. Comme par exemple, euh, l'année 2020, on a réussi un financement StatFound dans le cadre de prévenir le COVID-19. Et là, euh, on s'est retrouvé dans une zone où les femmes n'avaient pas le droit de prendre la parole devant un public. Et là, euh, on a montré aux responsables communautaires que les femmes ont, ont aussi un rôle très important à jouer pour le changement de comportement, aussi longtemps que ce sont eux qui sont les responsables de ménage. Et par là, on a travaillé avec un groupe mixte. Les femmes et les hommes, tous, sont allés sur le terrain et mobiliser la communauté sur le changement de comportement, sur comment se prévenir contre le les COVID-19. Donc, c'est une perception qu'on a trouvée dans, sa, dans cette communauté-là où les femmes vraiment ne pouvaient pas parler devant les gens, n'avaient pas droit à la parole. Les femmes étaient là seulement pour observer, assister à ce que les hommes faisaient dans la communauté. Mais avec cette approche, on est arrivé à les sensibiliser et les impliquer dans les activités communautaires. Et jusqu'à présent, c'est devenu quelque chose de routine où on a commencé à considérer la place de la femme dans les développements communautaires. À part cela, euh, nous avons aussi développé des, des projets, des projets qui consistaient à faciliter la communauté à accéder aux moyens de subsistance. Et là, on laissait la communauté choisir parce qu'on avait des programmes de, de levage, mais aussi de l'agriculture. Et là, chacun choisissait ce dont il avait besoin. Alors, pour arriver à équilibrer les agriculteurs et les éleveurs dans une même communauté, on organisait ce qu'on appelle la chaîne de solidarité. La chaîne de solidarité qui était une activité qui permettait aux communautés de faire l'échange des intrants, ce qu'on appelle les trocs. Donc, celui qui a la sémence donne à celui qui a l'élevage et celui qui a l'élevage donne une genitaire, un genitaire à celui qui a l'agriculture. Et là, ça nous a permis de résoudre certains problèmes communautaires aussi longtemps que nous sommes, nous habitons dans une zone de conflit. Alors, cet rapprochement des éleveurs agriculteurs, de membres de la communauté, nous permettait aussi de passer les messages sur la cohabitation pacifique. Mais un autre exemple que je voulais donner, à un certain moment, on voulait construire des banques de semences pour les villageois. Et nous, on pensait faire quelque chose de moderne. Mais quand on a travaillé avec la communauté, ils nous ont montré la façon, la manière facile de le faire et avec un faible coût que ce que nous, on prévoyait faire. Euh, C'est pourquoi nous devons toujours tenir compte des idées, des contributions communautaires avant de faire les choses. Si nous sommes en train de parler de la colonisation, 
Bien sûr, nous visons la transformation, le changement, mais nous devons toujours partir des valeurs, des idées communautaires pour bien faire et responsabiliser cette communauté pour la suite des temps. Parce que si vous ne les impliquez pas, si vous ne les associez pas, si vous ne considérez, si vous ne considérez pas leurs idées, c'est difficile que cette communauté devienne une communauté résiliente. Ce sont des projets qu'on a développés en 2016, 2017, 2018, mais jusqu'à aujourd'hui, on trouve que les choses existent encore. Les coopératives qu'on a mises en place sont là et ça fonctionne. Et quand ils ont besoin de conseils, ils ne manquent pas à recourir vers nous pour les orientations. C'est pourquoi nous devons beaucoup réfléchir pour rendre les choses vraiment locales et responsabiliser cette communauté-là. Vu que nous, les humanitaires, on est là pour un temps, mais eux, ils sont permanents et ils sont censés continuer à vivre, continuer à travailler, continuer à répondre aux situations de crise qui peuvent se présenter dans leur communauté. Euh, C'est ce que je pouvais dire par rapport à cette question liée à le, aux différents exemples que nous avons, nous, dans notre travail avec la communauté locale. Merci. Thank you so much. I think that's really important to make sure that the work that is being introduced are grounded on the values and the social norms that already exist and that you're making sure that you're also, while you're implementing a certain project, that you're also empowering the community itself and that you're able to amplify their voice or, you know, give them agency or whatever buzzwords it, are, it is that we're actually using. But it's important to make sure that whatever we're doing is not only needs-based, but that you're also working in partnership with the community because Precisely, as you said, like they're there permanently and we're just there mm -hmm. as, as project implementers and we leave as soon as the cycle is sort of complete. Um, that actually takes us to our third question, which works well with um, linking it together. So to Praditya, what do you would see as the links between this kind of community-led evidence gathering, uh, inclusivity and the decolonization? And how can we combine these approaches to our work to make it a bit more open and inclusive Um, and then I've got a few follow-on questions, but yeah, just what, what do you think about those, those kinds of combining the approaches? Yeah, perhaps um, I would start by saying that um, if we go back and reflect on the humanitarian charter, the very soul of that underpin what we do in the humanitarian sector. So all of it actually requires deep understanding of how community themselves transform after the shocking events or the disaster. So we might partly involve in the process of that transformation, but actually it is truly their own process. And those, and sometimes it's quite individual level, the, the process of those transformation and the way we capture things often doesn't allow us to tailor approach to that individualized transformation. And thus my argument is that we would not go far with solely relying on numbers or what is written in the log frame, for example. However, in our experience, um, with rooted impact, like doing project evaluation, this kind of attitude, attitudes on, on looking at numbers remain like adopted widely. The humanitarian response, there's this perception that if you don't measure things with numbers, it's not valid or it's not legitimate, for example. So same goes with academics, especially in psychology where, you know, pos positivism is very dominant. So I think, um, The first thing about like in, being inclusive is what I think what Anuarite and Asaid already mentioned is that giving voices uh, for uh, targeted communities to tell their own narratives. Um, and especially if we're looking at different characteristics of communities is telling narratives in their own way. Uh, so understanding their capacity um, and also barriers uh, in communication or in capturing changes and uh, because it will inform us how we could adapt our strategy in capturing the, those learning. For example, in my experience with uh, the disability community, um, I've worked as NGOs before and we've dealt with um, like disaster involving people with disability, but even the, the perception of um, 
changes or like services for people with disability is not there yet because like they're like this uh, humanitarian response organization not even thought about them yet so and sometimes as well uh, the disability community or people with disabilities they're not aware that they have the authority or power to uh, demand things or uh, raising their voices, for example. So it is very important to identify who's in the community that might be able to facilitate this exchange or communication. So um, we as NGOs or humanitarian actors could understand the way they um, they express themselves. So. Uh, so referring to what I said, I think it is very important for like researchers, practitioners or activists to start from the basic that uh, to understand this is their process and let the opportunity for them to express the transformation in their own way. And we could then try to understand how to best capture the transformation process um, uh, tailored to their like capacity or um, ability, for example. However, it is actually better, uh, I mean, easier to tell than to act because decolonizing evidence sometimes requires time and to, for, for, uh, for to enable communities to be able to raise their voice also need empowerment and in itself, it, it's, it needs process so and also if we want to be participatory for example so it needs what Anwar they said that uh, it is an empowerment process in itself so the the monitoring and evaluation is not summative evaluation but more of like process evaluation in itself as well because there's a component of empowerment I think that that would be the answer from Asa thank you Thanks, Praditya. I'd love to hear a little bit more, especially about exactly what you're saying, going outside the log frame and kind of taking um, maybe a new approach or a tool that we can add to what exists already, but being mindful of everyone's time and, you know, strains on our resources. But um, that's a great idea that you shared that it, one approach could be that you gather the feedback and the evidence from the community and then the organization or the implementer itself does the work of translating that to the existing whatever frameworks that are there, either a log frame or, um, you know, a more, more solid results based framework or something like that. But what else have you used that can sort of bridge that gap and, and build the agency? And is there anything else that you have alongside your log frame and, you know, KPIs and everything that's more traditional that complements it? Um, and maybe if you have some ideas of how it was to introduce such new ideas to an organization or new frameworks or new ways of doing things. Um, maybe a follow-on question within that framework when you're introducing new ideas to a donor through reporting how do you balance out what is their reporting needs versus the need of everyone to sort of be a bit more community-based and participatory and inclusive um, and to to perhaps introduce some new ideas that might be outside the scope of what's in the donor template but that might be beneficial um, so are we slowly introducing innovations or are we innovating within our ngos only and that's also for everyone yeah. else. Thank you very much. So I think uh, the process is not like separate from one another. I mean, like if we want to decolonize evidence, we need to decolonize our approach in monitoring and evaluation and reporting, actually. So we could start from there. And with regard, with, with regards to the approach, again, I would like to underline that any approaches that we do need to allow capturing voices of targeted communities and even allowing them to, to be involved in the process of co-producing evidence itself, like uh, having them like reformulate or formulating or co-formulating the research question, for example, or evaluation questions based on their perspective of what is changes or what is inclusive, for example. And, I understand that that is perhaps for some organization can be quite challenging because take a sample for inclusion that has been, I don't know, like discussed for how many years now, but in our work around disability inclusion, even getting organization to start thinking about involving or identifying people with disabilities within their work, it's sometimes really hard to change, uh, you know, because sometimes people 
or organization might think, oh, that's not my organizational mandates. So really um, we need like transformation, not only uh, from the evaluation side, but the overall policy of being decolonized uh, in our approach of uh, program delivery, for example. So in uh, with regards to innovative approach, I had two particular examples. Uh, so the first one um, of which I had the opportunity to partly involve is uh, the participatory videos. So I had the opportunity uh, to, to do or make a participatory video about two refugee camps in Greece with the uh, ASP Germany teams. So participatory video is actually um, an avenue for a group of people or community to create their own film and tell a story about themselves in their own language and their own word. Yeah. So there has no, uh, there's been no uniform, uh, uniform movement to practice participatory video, but usually um, it will start with like they, they're developing uh, the angle or the question or the, the setting that they would like to present, and then they're involved in the the capturing the the all the element that needed for the film. They they're themselves doing the interview of affected people. So, but somehow, but again, as I said before, it they might need um, time and process to be able to do this. So we perhaps as humanitarian actors could facilitate this the empowerment process as well. That's one example that I did with the participatory video. And then another one that I'm currently working on is uh, using a photo voice uh, method. So it's actually similar to participatory um, video in a sense that um, it, it used like visuals, but more like a static visuals only use photo, but the, the way or what, what to be captured um, and the story about the, the, the photo itself comes from the individual, it's not com comes for us. We only give guide, like for example, what is the most important uh, changes that happens to you because of this project, for example, and then they take a picture as a representation of their change and they can still tell a story about that. So that's one of, uh, two of the examples that I did before. Thank you so much. I think that's super interesting and uh, sort of turning it around to say, what can what can we use that would satisfy both the donor and our maybe internal reporting needs, but is also more interesting and using more creative visual ways to represent that through videos or through photo essays. I think that's wonderful and also speaks to what we were discussing about narrative change coming from within the community, that they need to be empowered to speak about their own stories and their own voices and literally in their own languages as well. Um, that sounds really interesting. Saeed, did you have any examples that you'd like to add? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll take forward the conversation slightly more and I, I'll just say that uh, like, why not only the examples? Uh, I think one of the fundamental issue we are facing uh, as a development humanitarian practitioner, we look uh, into the monitoring uh, as an accountability tool, monitoring your evaluations. As a result, we are less flexible uh, in terms of innovation with it. It's just like, like we won't consider uh, uh, innovation in a financial system, uh, a lot of innovation in financial system. Similarly, we are less uh, ac acute or accepted in terms of uh, accepting innovation in the monitoring system. Uh, and this link, with the, uh, this link with the accountability aspect. So this basic framework around how we look into the assessments uh, into the humanitarian and development world. So I think this is one fundamental challenge which we face and we need to think about it uh, as, a, as a sector. The second, the second uh, important uh, uh, hurdle which we face, and I think this linked with the previous panelist conversation, uh, is the lack of trust. So we, we, uh, as we lay, we do not have full confidence uh, on the at the grassroots level. As a result, we do not engage communities per se or even the local organization uh, in the monitoring and in the evaluation uh, in a in a more uh, inclusive manner. Uh, a third challenge, which also comes, is is the time availability. So let's uh, let me take the example of final evaluations. The final evaluation usually take place towards the end of the program. And many times when uh, 
you you don't want to experiment with it uh, uh, a lot so you end up with the traditional tool focus group discussion key informant interviews household surveys and on a very seldom occasions you actually thought about evaluation you thought about monitoring as a whole process of the uh, delivery mechanism uh, so uh, none of the program manager will like to have a scenario when they experimented an innovation and down the road after six months when they already reported to the donor a person coming to them and they say oh our finding was incorrect and we need to uh, fix into it uh, and uh, one of the key challenge we have is this uh, capacity so something which we need to work on it more uh, closely uh, and lastly the time and resources available for it so uh, even if we say resources uh, it's not talking about financial resources, at least from a timeliness perspective, we do need to consider the assessments as an integral part of the uh, program delivery. Uh, and we need to see maybe the, there are unique solutions to individual uh, scenarios. So the engagement of the community leaders, engagement of the uh, youth. If you are talking about a governance program, how does the wise side of the accountability work? Uh, are we talking about when we when the youth are coming and the community uh, communities are saying that the activities you are doing is well not relevant for us? Are we willing to listen to this feedback? I, I'll just give one example uh, before we conclude. And it's not necessarily that it's the community who are always at the right side. And many times they are not at the right side. So we need to uh, 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 we need to stand our ground as well. So uh, let me give you an example of a social exclusion uh, inclusion program. And in this uh, local, uh, in this uh, inclusion program, uh, we wanted to uh, integrate the marginalized and the mi minority communities uh, into the bigger decision-making village level forums. And the majority community in fact refused. Uh, so it was the success from their perspective was not a success from our perspective. So there was a value clash. Uh, and from us, uh, it took us a time and it, we, we we took them to a different counterfactual scenario where the majority community was in fact in a minority scenario and the minority community was a majority where they were living in a more uh, in a status where they were uh, having joint decision making in a, uh, in a consultative manner and only seeing the counterfactual in a different village in the same uh, districts uh, only then they changed their heart and change uh, their opinion. To, uh, to conclude, uh, even though communities are important, we need to work with them, but I think uh, we need to see what are our minimum value, what are the values we can compromise, to what extent we can go further, and we should be open uh, for risk as well as uh, open for innovations as well. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Sai. That was really very interesting and very useful. And I think that so much of that speaks to the challenges, not only for the implementing organization or the partner, but it's also the sort of philosophical struggle. Um, because what you're mentioning about accountability is exactly it. The, a lot of NGOs, you know, might say that our accountability is more in terms of compliance and due diligence and our accountability is towards the donor. Whereas perhaps if you're opening it up a little bit further, participatory evaluation maybe suggests that accountability is towards the community and the people that you're actually serving and working for, um, which in, in that case go back to, goes back to what Praditya was saying about getting the research questions and putting it to the community and getting their feedback on the research questions that are part of an evaluation anyway. Does this make sense to you? Is what we're investigating even of value? Or are we just answering the same questions time and time again? Are we contributing anything that's useful to you? Which is exactly what you're saying, the value clashes with the community. So perhaps that's something that we can do is that we start to rethink who it is that we're actually serving and who's the main audience of our work and why it is that we're doing reporting or M MER. And I always look at it as a, as a cycle of, um, of a project. So there's planning, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And then you feed from the learning straight into planning a more effective project the next time. In which case, when you're doing your learning exercise, you have to go to the community and exactly skip all of these household surveys, KIIs and everything, and just break it open. And, you know, in India, we have these panchayats. Maybe that's an opportunity to sit and talk in an informal way and just discuss the work. Uh, we shared an idea with uh, some of our colleagues about once an evaluation is finished, the report is often shared within the NGO or with our community, our social media, our donors. But it's very rarely, if ever, shared with the communities themselves, with the people. 
that's an option is that we can share those reports with the people who are actually affected by our work and get their thoughts and get their perspectives so that the next time we're actually able to target their needs more adequately because they're the ones that we're doing all of this for so there's a both an implementation and perhaps a philosophical shift that we can have at an organization who are we working for um this is really interesting thank you may i add to that may i add to please that go for it go for it so i think uh with the with the participatory video or photo voice for example sometimes like community themselves they can be involved in the you know dissemination of information or the advocacy post project and they themselves present the narrative they themselves show the photo this is from me this is uh, what i would like to tell you about what uh, the changes that i have experienced so decolonized evidence also uh, perhaps entails their involvement in the advocacy or sharing the learning itself so it doesn't uh, doesn't always come from us absolutely thank you so much and i can see that there's been a lot of uh, comments in the chat window i will go through them in a minute but i've been so engaged in these panel conversations if there were any um burning questions for right now perhaps we can take a quick moment before we go to our last uh, question and then we'll open up to q and a's Okay, let's move forward. Um, okay, so Saeed, going back to you. So we have a, um, why do you think it's difficult to promote locally relevant approaches to assess humanitarian and development action? And specifically, what are the four main barriers? I don't know why I decided to choose four, but I did. So let's say four main barriers. And also to the other panelists, if you have, what are, what are the challenges to, to implement your actions using either your experience or perhaps something that you anticipate your a new approach that you're going to um, add next year um and besides covid what challenges you anticipate in implementing something that's a bit more participatory four challenges so so i i'll start with and i think uh, i'll start with the uh the basic framework we need to understand the the we need to question the basic framework why we are doing a particular activity are we doing it from per, from a perspective of learning are we doing it from a perspective of uh, uh, accountability? Are we doing it from a perspective of feeding into the future program? Uh, are we doing it from accountability to the beneficiaries? So I think this whole basic framework, that the notion around the accountability, the framework, the, the conditions under which we operate as a male uh, practitioners, I think this is the fundamental challenge. And the second one uh, I'll, I'll mention, and there are four, so maybe other colleagues can also uh, uh, chip in is the disconnect with the communities. Uh, so we need to engage the communities who might also be recipient of the assistance as well, more and more uh, in the uh, monitoring uh, and evaluation and assessments of the activities. And not only at the end of the activity where we are talking about the data collection, rather just like Viditya mentioned, at, even at the start of maybe the questions we are asking, we need to question ourselves, are we even asking the right questions uh, from them? Um, and we can do it. Again, I'm not talking about changing the whole system. We can do it again within the frame of, of main framework OECD dark criteria relevance. Uh, again, I'll give an example of community. In an earthquake situation scenario where we were responding, uh, when we went there, we went with the tents and the community said, no, we don't need tents give us plastic sheets and the shelter material because the tents will not last for long uh, and the tents is not uh, conducive for us to overcome the damages we suffered, whether we want to start rebuilding. So for them, the emergency phase was over within two to three days time. They were already thinking about rebuilding the, uh, the uh, their lives. On the other case, we went to again to a flood affected areas after six months and we went with the early recovery response. And again, when we went there, we were so surprised. The guys were still in the emergency phase because what happened was around six months ago, uh, or one year ago, they had a new road built in. So then the, and the road was acting as a dam. So the water was not flushing out from the area. So even after six months of the flood, it was still under flooded. So again, connecting what we are thinking as a monitoring and evaluation as a designer with what the situation on the ground. Uh, I'll stop here and maybe other police can uh, jump in. Thank you so much, Said. That was super interesting. It's exactly it. Like, 
why are we doing this who are we serving it for what's the framework and then making it very community based and thank you for your examples it's very sort of uh, real in our heads uh, praditi anwarate did you have any other um, examples of barriers to promote locally relevant approaches that you'd like to share which could perhaps get uh, some conversations going Well, we did some research about um, a more specific topic, actually locally led and accessible um, approach, uh, especially for, um, as I mentioned, the disability community. Sometimes, you know, like people say, this is not my mandate. Disability is too technical, for example. Uh, where whereas there are actually ways around that you could like or organization, humanitarian organization, could work with. representative organization from the disability community who knows exactly the characteristic of the targeted community how to interact or how communicate with them so uh sometimes uh the the idea is also like working with the local people on asking the right question but also the way to ask the right question as well because sometimes we don't know the context we don't know how to communicate we speak different languages for example So I think uh, that's that's probably from uh, from our experience. Thank you so much, Anwarita. I see you have your hand up. Anwarita, did you have anything to add? I think you. Oui. Uh, Oui, je voulais partager quelque chose comme défi dans la responsabilisation communautaire, voire même le développement communautaire. Pour, pour l'expérience de la RDC, il y a souvent beaucoup de problèmes parce que quand vous intervenez dans une zone où il y avait conflit à un certain moment, vous aidez ce communauté-là à reprendre la vie normale et après... Un mois, deux mois, trois mois de votre intervention, le conflit encore se présente, le communauté encore se déplace. Et là, on sait, ça devient comme si on, on faisait quelque chose sans rien faire. C'est un problème majeur pour nous. Et là, on se demande jusqu'à quand on continuera à demander du de financement, des appuis au Bayer pour arriver à aider une communauté à se développer d'une manière durable, aussi longtemps qu'il y a des situations de conflit qui persistent. C'est une question vraiment qui nous dépasse en tant qu'organisation organisation nationale qui travaille directement avec des communautés. C'est ce que je voulais partager comme défi lié à nos interventions dans nos communautés. Merci. Thank you, Anwarita. Um, I think you put your hand up again. Do you have anything else to add? No, je n'ai pas ajouté. Merci. Okay. No, that's absolutely. It. I think it's it's when you're working in an emergency or a disaster situation where the where the context itself shifts from one day to the next, it can be very difficult to look at what is the longer term sustainability that we can have here how does the situation going to shift from in six months time and what kind of presence do we need here and what availability is there and what can we prepare this community to respond better how can we um, respond better and help the community respond better to this uh, for, for the next time a, a, a disaster comes up um, it's a very interesting uh, idea and it's, it's a difficult conversation to kind of begin i think uh when we're dealing with such a, an emergency response which needs us to deploy something immediately but then you also need to take a more considered idea of how can we prepare for next time or what resilience do we need to implement in the community is there anything that we can add in terms of infrastructure that would help them over the longer term um before we go to q and a's i think we'll have um we'll have our final question which i think is going to be an interesting moment for us all to reflect Uh, and this is for all of our panelists. So, 
uh, please take it in turns. And I'd love to think about what are some of the steps that our sector, which includes donors, INGOs, local NGOs, the start network, what, what do we need to do to take to remove this Western lens of what success looks like, what m and &E as a whole looks like, um, how we do reporting, everything that we've been discussing, project planning and implementation, communicate, uh, communications and relationships with the communities, how we perceive our role in change and in the change process. Um, what are the steps that we can take and how can we make this shift? Um, and then perhaps to get a little bit more concrete, follow-up question of mine, um, if each of you could give me one example of this or one call to action or one thought that you'd like all of us as participants to take away from this, either an idea that we can mull over or I hate the phrase best practice, but you know, a best practice that we can kind of uh, think about and perhaps implement in something that we've been uh, considering, what has worked for you uh, or as some key lesson, just one main idea or a, or a, or a thought. And worry so you have your hand up so you can. Oui, oui. Euh, donc, par rapport à cette question, euh, je voulais d'abord faire savoir que les changements, c'est un processus. Ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on va faire du tic au tac. C'est un processus. Alors, pour y arriver, euh, les ONG internationales, les réseaux Stats Network et d'autres donateurs, ils doivent se sensibiliser mutuellement en se disant qu'il est temps de commencer à transférer les actions humanitaires au niveau local. Vu que c'est un processus, ils peuvent commencer à étudier, à analyser comment faire le transfert des compétences aux organisations nationales et locales, que tout soit au niveau local. Mais aussi, nous devons travailler beaucoup plus sur le renforcement des capacités, travailler sur le renforcement des capacités des structures locales en faisant ce qu'on appelle le transfert de compétences pour que, une fois on arrive à, à rendre effective la localisation, que ce structure-là arrive à se prendre en charge, à bien travailler mais aussi, eh, nous devons promouvoir ce qu'on appelle une collaboration étroite. La collaboration doit être étroite, avec égalité, et se mettre à la place des, 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 des locaux pour arriver à les responsabiliser. C'est ce que moi je voulais dire hein, par rapport à cette... Dernière question. Merci. Thank you so much, Anvita. That's absolutely it. I think having um, respectful, equal, close collaborations and relationships, respectful relationships and empowering local partners, perhaps through intermediaries or through local chapters of larger INGOs, uh, that could be a, a way forward. Uh, moving to our other panelists, any other ideas? Final answers to our last question. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start. Uh, so one of the aspects, uh, one of the steps we can take is uh, we should be willing to take risk. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm personally a person who uh, believes in baby steps, small steps. So uh, uh, as an action point, as a donor, as an implementer, we can make a, a commitment at our end that in each coming project, we are going to have one small action building, something which is not conventional, something which talks about more locally led action, something which talks about uh, challenging the, not, the way we do the uh, assessments. Uh, it can be anything. And, uh, and these things are, as a fundamental, these have to be built in with the, with the communities. So, uh, and then what are the uh, required steps to achieve that particular one? So if we are talking about increased community engagement, maybe we need to start community when we are talking about mobilizing them. We should also identify one or two or three individuals who are going to support us with the monitoring purposes, 
capacitating them and uh, then also reporting back on these ones. So starting with not changing the whole system in a single week or a year or a month, but starting slowly and building up in what we learn and then disseminating it and communicating it back to the communities. Uh, over. Thank you so much. That was great. I think I think that's uh, committing to one small change and then slowly building to, because as we all know, these systems changes take a long time. We've all, I think, done some behavior change work, social change work. These things are not easy. It takes several years to do. So if we're shifting an entire ME system, one change per project, I think, is a, is a great uh, way to start. Thank you, Sarah. That's a great learning. Um, Praditi, anything to add? Yeah, um, I also agree with what An Anwarite and Said uh, have mentioned uh, before. Uh, to, perhaps I would like that uh, to add that to highlight the process that this is a process and we need to transform together. So not only us as implementer, mm -hmm. but also donors sometimes because here I see in the chat sometimes the bottleneck of this transformation is the donor itself and it's not really unique to humanitarian actors uh, even in research for example uh, academic research for example sometimes there is like a constraining policies against this principle or new new ideas so um, as a start perhaps organization can identify actually what held them back from being um, to decolonize evidence or being more inclusive, for example, and also identifying capacity, um, uh, what available capacity that they can use to start um, acting uh, to decolonize evidence, for example. So, so this organization can help also understanding of their own practices. Are they being inclusive or are they being um, community-led, for example, and then, uh, sometimes also like don't forget to collaborate and learn from others. Uh, I think this kind of forum gives us a good platform to share um, ideas and also learning um, from another another organization, for example, because that can be one of the, the way for organization to start um, action, like baby steps, as Sai mentioned. Absolutely. No, and I think that's um, that's a really great idea. And we've already started. I see that uh, Start Network and Helen has been sharing a few blog posts and articles. And I think moments like this, when we can take three full days to learn, explore and grow, um, you know, these are ideas, moments where we can share new ideas or new approaches, discuss projects where we've been successful or something that we've learned and then get each other's thoughts on this. Um, and, you know, we all have uh, the the start network we all have LinkedIn to discuss these things and take these conversations forward and I think the more we work in partnership with each other it's not just that it's the entire system that needs to shift so it's not just that there's a bottleneck at the donors there are certain practices at big INGOs that are as restrictive and as bureaucratic as donors um, and I say this also from my experience in a donor it's it's not necessarily that it's all only their fault you know so slowly if we also shift the way in which we think about uh, the process, who is in power, who is serving, what it is that we're even doing this for, like Saeed said. So, and then and then pick slowly one thing that we can shift and then share ideas with each other and build these networks of communities of practice or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, this is all really great food for thought. And thank you all for giving such detailed examples of your work. I've come away with so many, so many notes uh, and so many thoughts, and I'll be definitely carrying all of these forwards. Um, so that's the end of our panel, but we have several questions. So if you just bear with me a moment, I'm going to go through the uh, questions that you've all been posting in the chat. All right. So I have one here. Uh, amongst international humanitarian agencies, two agendas or innovations in terms of assessing or coordinating on needs analysis, which might be of relevance, are the increased emphasis on joint needs assessments, JNAs, and the shift in some context towards area-based coordination. Have the speakers seen any examples of efforts to support locally-led community participatory methods for research and analysis feeding into these agendas or not? Or any reflections on whether and how they describe could inform, or any reflections on whether these different approaches to assessments and coordinations work? Is that clear? I'm just reading it out. 
So uh, I can give it a go, and then other yeah. colleagues can uh, jump in. So uh, joint need assessment is a uh, is a brilliant idea. is being experimented within the UN agencies and within uh, within the cluster with other NGOs. Uh, th there are mixed experiences. So I, I first I'll I'll talk about the joint experiences, then uh, coming to the other questions as well. But it does take a lot of time in terms of uh, so on was. On one side, we do talk about a lot of needs assessment, but on the other side, there is a huge amount of politics involved. So everybody wants to talk, uh, take something out of it. So by the end of the day, maybe uh, if a need is not very much clear, it still find a way in the uh, in the way in the time and the time it takes to conduct the joint need assessment, especially in relation to early recovery. I think is something which uh, the cluster needs to reflect on. So that's one aspect. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, reflections on the uh, uh, locally led researches and others, we do see uh, uh, them playing a role uh, in at the analysis stage when the when there are certain trends coming up and different uh, colleagues coming from the uh, different organization, not only the local organization but also international organization, they coming together and they identifying uh, uh, trends and also trying to understand what is behind the trend. So even though the, we do get the number. But the, uh, what's the story behind the numbers? Uh, but at the same time, um, many times these uh, researches are and assessments are uh, tied up to resources. So we do see uh, not only the the debate around the research, but also the how how the research is then interpreted, uh, leading to uh, resources one way or another. So, but at, uh, some progress, I must say, in the last five years, is definitely been made. Thank you so much, Sahil. Praditya Anwarati, anything on that question about JNAs? Okay, so perhaps we'll move on to the next uh, question. Moment. So much conversation in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm needing to scroll along. Okay. So the next one we have is um, for 45 day programs, which the start fund prioritizes, it's really hard to expect any change in this short time period. And often these are in fragile contexts. Can softer approaches like MSC more significant change or videos work in such a situation where no behavior or any other change might be possible? Um, what kind of approach is possible for a decolonization of evidence framework in a 45 day emergency project. Anyone has any thoughts, just feel free to unmute them. Yeah, Praditya. Yeah, I could, I could share um, initial thought on that. So uh, for the two specific approaches that I shared, participatory video might, might be challenging in this um, program context, but perhaps like a photo voice or MSC might be um, a, a, a more like a suitable approach. Uh, however, the, the, the thing that I would like to highlight in this question is about change itself, because any small intervention in a fragile context that you might mention might lead to change. So, so change is not a final avenue, but we could measure the, you know, incremental uh, changes that happens perhaps step little by little within those 45 days. So not doing is doing it as a summative evaluation, uh, but doing it more as like a process evaluation. What has changes? Uh, what has changed in the process or even smallest change that uh, these people experience from the 45 days program, for example? Thanks, Praditya. Any other, Anwarita, Saeed, any other thoughts? So, so let me give an example. Uh, we, we have a place which is known as uh, CB Jacobabad. It's in, in Pakistan. It's uh, one of the hottest places in the world. So we talk about uh, 49, 50 centigrade temperature uh, in June, July. Uh, uh, and Start Network recently supported uh, 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 a heat wave response there. It was a short uh, term response uh, the, uh, for a few uh, weeks, uh, but 
I, I think that, and we were, we were start partner to uh, do the uh, impact assessment and the monitoring for that activity. And it was quite amazing to see even that, uh, that it's not the time which, the, which is the, uh, the, which make the difference. It's the innovation, it's the intervention, the timeliness on the intervention. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there are many takes away from that uh, study which we take. But one of the one of the main takeaway from our side was opening up a whole new frame of humanitarian intervention, even even opening up the window for people to consider that building up a shadow, a shed with the with the with the availability of drinking water, cold drinking water, can also mean you are saving lives, you are supporting people. And uh, and then also the cho the choices of the place where such intervention was taking place. So it was close to the uh, bus stops, wagon stops, where the people were traveling in congested places, and uh, they were quite exhausted, sweating. So uh, so on one hand, uh, we do talk about uh, a small intervention, not only financially but also from a time perspective. But at the same time, it's the intervention itself. Uh, which opens new doors, and we need to take opportunity from these doors. Uh, and uh, in terms of the transaction cost, it was also quite manageable. So we talk about value for money. We talk about the what it value it deliver for the partner donor. I think there's quite huge learning uh, from such kind of experiences. Thanks, Naid. And I think. Um... Continuing on this idea of value for money and donor priorities, we actually had a question on that. So I'm going to read it directly. Too often, donors focus on measuring success on outputs and want to see value for money analysis. What are the speaker's thoughts on this and how we could overcome such a Western framework with an alternative approach that's more focused on communities' concepts of growth and sustainability? It can be really interesting, especially when you're doing, I just wanted to add here, I think when you're a donor, it's an institutional funder. I think the scope for innovation or adding something new, especially when you're doing VFM analysis for uh, the UK Department for International Development, now FCDO, I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, challenge to see how we can bring in something a little bit new and innovative, as you were saying, Said. But I would love some thoughts. I think it's important. We need to all change it. And beginning with institutional donors, we need to we need to really change this stuff. So, so I, I, I'll, I'll take a start, and maybe other colleagues can then uh, uh, chip in. Uh, I think as a as a community, as a development humanitarian practitioner community, uh, we there is a general lack of uh, appreciating and even understanding the value of money. So, if uh, like if we say eight out of ten studies, we just want to do something out of doing it i guess maybe if uh, and then it's pretty difficult to uh, conduct a quality value for money analysis so and uh, one of the key challenge we face is the assumptions so on one hand we take such as what assumptions which may not which may not be even valid uh, to a great extent and uh, even the expectation uh, from the from the donor perspective uh, is a bit too high with the value for money. I, I, I by pers pers personally do do value for money, but I'm not the biggest fan of it just because of the very, very strong assumptions. And I think this is one of the very first questions which goes to the conversation. Uh, what's the difference between the community perception and the uh, donor perception? So the value for money have a lot of translation into what will come in the future. Whereas the uh, the donors, uh, whereas the community is seeing more in terms of the immediate uh, immediate intervention. So uh, uh, it's a, it's an open question. I think it's a big debate, uh, and let's see what other colleagues think about it. Absolutely, Praditya, Anvarite, any thoughts on this VFM question? Um, thank you uh, very much. I think I would. I would also agree with what Said has mentioned. And in terms of answer for like value for money, there's also one great answer from Hannah uh, in the chat that perhaps it, it is not, um, you know, we could complement, I think, uh, information or evidence about value for money from the quantitative or numbers, for example, or in terms of currency. But then we can also complement how we could 
qualify uh, value for money uh, from this alternative approach. So these are the real changes happening. These are the value of each of these like $1 invested to this project. Uh, so it's not mathematical calculation, but you can see real changes from the community. So you, we can like present both sets of data and let like the donor or the funder or people who donate to this uh, project um, read or perhaps experience themselves, yeah. Thank you, Paditya. Amarita. Hello. Hi, we can hear you now. Hello. Oui, oui, oui. <laughs> oui donc, euh, tel que nous l'avons dit dès le départ, c'est quelque chose sur laquelle nous tous nous devons travailler. Nous devons travailler. Chacun doit faire la mobilisation là où il travaille, dans son pays, dans sa région, pour voir si le processus peut déjà s'amorcer et commencer à arriver à voir quelques changements par rapport à la responsabilisation communautaire. C'est tout pour moi, merci. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I think, um, Hannah, your comment was really interesting. And I think that is a great way to propose an alternative way of doing m &E to a donor. Um, now, I work at OSF, which is granted not an institutional funder, but it still is one of the larger donors that has a lot of the similar challenges. Now, if you're reporting back to USAID or FCDO, then you're maybe going to have a bit more of a difficulty in sharing with them along with the traditional VFM. And you say, okay, we're going to qualify. Here's a story of change. Here's a case study, not just the boring, sorry, the templates that they always share. Uh, here's something that's a bit more alive and that is more relevant to the community and that's innovative and creative and actually interesting to read. Um, donors themselves are always looking for ways to innovate. So we're all kind of bogged down by the system. So if you have these kinds of relationships with your funders during monthly meetings or monitoring visits, take that chance to perhaps discuss with them how you could uh, add something to the reports or to your monitoring framework. And would they be interested in also seeing case studies? Because these are all things that we put into our annual reports and we share on social media anyway. So it would not be necessarily creating something extra for your donor. But if you share this with your funder, depending on the relationship you have, depending on the kind of funder that you have, um, there is the scope for them to add it to the template. I have added these many times to uh, templates to be innovative and responsive and also to give me something interesting to read sitting in an office. Um, so this could be an opportunity for you to perhaps cultivate that time and that relationship with an institutional funder, if that's who you have, and discuss how maybe you can add it as an annex or something, stories of change, as Helen just said, um, or an interesting case study, or sharing these participatory videos from, uh, from Greece, as Praditya was talking about, just to find these moments to, to do some advocacy upwards uh, to your donors and, and just kind of push, it, push this uh, important need forwards to be a bit more open and responsive. Um, just my two cents in there. But, um, we have a few more minutes. I think we have nine minutes until the end of this session. So if there were any other questions or thoughts or reflections, um, either in the chat or feel free to just unmute yourselves and discuss. I think this is a great opportunity for us to share some, some just put some thoughts out there. Okay, great. So we actually had a question. Sorry, I missed it earlier. Thank you, Alessandra, for pointing it out. Um, so Ditya, you spoke about this a little bit, but perhaps you could uh, discuss a little bit more on these participatory videos. Um, the question was, have you faced any challenges in using these tools? And what are the key suggestions you would have to practitioners who want to try similar approaches? 
Oh yeah. So I I've also responded to Alessandra question. So uh, perhaps for participatory videos, it requires some time uh, for the process itself, because like the setup, uh, the the trading uh, for the community themselves, uh, even getting the community on board uh, with the process as well may require some time, because in like different community contacts like people might not be aware that they have the rights to voice uh, their perspectives or some other context they are afraid to do so because you know like in some political situation that community are not allowed to speak so uh, sometimes getting people on boards also um, need uh, you know time a lot of time to do that um, more like uh, so we don't force them to do uh, uh, their, we don't force their participation. It's, uh, it's really need to be voluntary. Uh, that's the first challenge. I think in terms of um, uh, time requires uh, in producing the video. So for, from my experience, it could take from six to 10 weeks to produce one video, participatory video uh, from the concept or from the approach uh, from like approaching communities until the production of uh, the movie itself. So it, it is quite long to do so. And then the, the other thing might be the, the technicality around it. So it needs like someone who has a videography, videography experience as well as the tool. But there are ways around that we can always, uh, we can always use what is available uh, in the community. We can even use like cell phones or um you know more um like camera like a simple camera for example as long as it could capture video thank you so much praditya um were there any other uh, final thoughts or ideas from uh saeed anwarite Uh, I, I think we had a great discussion and the questions which we are uh, asking, these are right questions. Um, we do need to change. We do need to move forward. But at the same time, we, when we are moving forward, we do need to check uh, whether uh, if the, the direction we are moving, is it something which is adding, uh, going to add value. So th there is a lot of strengths in the current system as well. Uh, so instead of instead of doing things which we may take a two step backward, we need to build up on this. Uh, the COVID-19 has provided lo a lot of opportunities at how we can think differently, how we can remotely engage communities, the, uh, the use of digital uh, monitoring tools, digitalization of the uh, activities, uh, cameras, uh, diaries, uh, both from a wise perspective, both from accountability perspective, both from learning perspective. There, there are, is a lot of uh, things which took place in the last one, one and a half year. I think we, as a humanitarian world, we need to learn from it. And finally, Start Network is such an excellent resource because they are having multiple intervention uh, across the world for multiple contexts. Uh, Helen and the team, they are in a position to uh, potentially not only summarize these findings, but also to replicate it in other parts of the world. And uh, they, they, I must say that they are moving in the right direction and uh, good luck to them in the, uh, in the months and years to follow. Thank you so much, Saeed. And Rita, did you have anything to, sorry, I think the, Perhaps I'll get. So I think everything that we've been discussing today has been so um, interesting and informative, and especially the link between um, between inclusivity, participation, community led, locally led, and decolonizing. They're all sort of several sides of the same twelve sided dice. Uh, I don't know if we have any other Dungeons and Dragons fans. Um, but I think this is an important conversation to keep going because these are many levels on which we need to be engaging. Uh, gender diversity, age diversity, and who, who are we actually working for and conversations to have internally within teams 
at NGOs, and then to share forwards with our clients, with our donors, um, etc. As I mentioned um, earlier in the chat, we have a sort of informal community of practice on LinkedIn. There's a monitoring and evaluation uh, book club. I would be fascinated to continue this conversation with, with anyone who's interested. Um, because with a group of researchers, we're actually working on a manual on how to decolonize m and &E specifically. It's going to be very practice-based workshops, toolkits, trainings, all kinds of things. So I'd love your thoughts on this. And if you want to uh, connect on LinkedIn, just a sort of shameless self-plug right now, I'm going to add my links at the bottom of the page. Um, but I think these are there's so much food for thought that you that the panelists have already shared about slowly implementing things, representing the community's voice a little bit better, listening to them when you're planning a, a project properly, considering sustainability in an emergency context, post-conflict context. Um, there's lots to consider. And I think we just had a final question from Christine. Um, and then perhaps after that, we can uh, wrap up and I'll hand over to Alessandra for a final um, notes. So Christine asks, with the video reporting to, to you, Ditya, um, do you find people represent themselves in a performative way? Uh, I guess if something like a standard meal tool is designed to get objective responses with videos, is there a way to ensure that you're getting legitimate responses and not what people might think you might want to say, especially if it's not anonymized? Thank you for that, that question, Christine. I think, um, as I mentioned, uh, when I explained about the process of participatory video, so what to present and how they would like to present is one of the decisions that the community themselves uh, need to come up with. So, um, but usually the story uh, and the, like, the way they present themselves in front of the video is what would you see uh, exactly in their like daily activity or the real case situation in their own context. So it's not necessarily uh, scripted. It is scripted in their own way. I mean, like, what do they want to say? It's based on their own thing. We, we only uh, facilitate the process of um, what they need to do in terms of make uh, steps of making that participatory video. Does uh, that make sense or answering your question, Christine? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So thank you, everyone, for all of your thoughts, your insightful yes, questions, all of the panelists. Of course, I could talk to you all day, I think, about this. Um, but I'm going to hand over to uh, Alessandra for final wrap-ups. But merci uh, tous, thank merci you everyone aussi. so much. Thank you, Sinyukta. Um, I think you've just done a wonderful job. Um, I don't really have very much to add, but just thank to you, Paditia, Saeed, and Anwarid for your wonderful contribution. Um, I think, yeah, we're definitely keen to keep this conversation going, so we'll definitely connect. Um, with you um, and it would be absolutely wonderful to work together on some sort of like action or processes and manuals on how we can really take all of these principles um, that we discussed today into action. There's just one more thing that I wanted to mention to everyone which I posted in the chat. Um, if you can please look at this survey, I just put a link in the chat, but just to mention the Star Fund team is working on a new learning grant opportunity and that will be directed to members, so certain network members. And that will be an opportunity to develop locally relevant approaches to assessing humanitarian action. So that's very relevant to our session today. It's a very early stages. We're still working on the design. So please do fill in the survey. And if you're keen, we'll definitely like to have your thoughts and maybe have you part of some design workshops. So I think on that, we can just close. And it was just a wonderful session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone.